Hey, Jody here. This is the first podcast that I've posted here on my YouTube channel. I'm just trying something here. I'm trying to get some awareness out. A lot of you might know already that I do a weekly podcast with Roy Crumrine and Jonathan Lewis, and it's called the Welding Tips and Tricks Podcast. So we're up to episode 53 already, and episode 53 is what I'm posting here today. It's purge welding. It's kind of a continuation of some videos that I did recently where I welded some stainless steel and talked about purge that led into this. So three guys who are all in on this welding craft talking about purge welding. So I'll put the links in the description of where else you can listen to the podcast, Libsyn, uh, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, etc. The links will be underneath this YouTube video in, um, in the description box. It's been a lot of fun. I've learned a ton. It's been received really well. We've got way over a half a million downloads so far and uh, no end in sight. So episode 53, Purge Welding. Let's do it. Hey, thanks for listening to the Welding Tips and Tricks podcast. I'm Roy Crumrine here with Jody Collier. Hello. And Jonathan Lewis. Hello, everyone. With Jody's video that he posted being on welding stainless and purging, we thought it'd be kind of a fun topic to talk a little bit more about purging because it can be a really important thing in some applications and some other applications. You can kind of do a little workarounds to get where you don't have to actually purge your parts out. We just thought it'd be kind of fun to talk about that a little bit today. Yeah, and you know we don't have all the answers, so there's going to be disagreements, and, it, and a lot of it really does boil down to what's the application for the weld you're making. You know, it, does it have to have utmost corrosion resistance? Like, is it going to be in a chlorine environment or something like that, or is you know pretty much having most of the corrosion resistance going to be okay? Is it just tap water that it's going to be exposed to this part? It makes a lot of difference because if you're going to purge everything, you're going to increase the cost of the fabrication. So that's where the conversation starts today. Like, when do you need to purge? When do you don't? And we're just gonna we're just gonna draw on on our own experiences and and try to keep the conversation going. And so, don't think that we know everything about this, but I think that we've got probably a lot to say about it. Yeah, if, if I'm ever doing a stainless part and I have the option to purge it, I'll try however I can to purge it with if I have any fittings that'll fit on there or some way to tape something on or use aluminum foil to make some type of kind of a dam bladder behind it that I can manipulate in there. There's quick and easy ways to make things happen where you don't have to maybe purge out a full container. You can dam it up so you're only doing just a little portion of it. And it just makes the weld go a lot nicer and flows better. But at the same time, like Jody said, it, it makes the part cost a little bit more and it takes a little bit more time to do it. So you kind of have to weigh out your options if it's worth it or not. Yeah, and that's where the, the conversation starts with the, the most recent video that I posted while we're recording this anyway, in which I, I put together a little four-sided manifold, stainless steel manifold, using eighth-inch stainless steel sheet and outside corner joints. And for those first outside corner joints, I just used an aluminum angle for backing. So, I mean, it's been my experience that if you clamp that aluminum good and tight and use it for backing and you have chill bars, when you look at the backside, even if you penetrate through, it's a pretty good purge. It's comparable to a decent purge with argon, like less than half a percent of oxygen content. So you'll get a little bit of, little bit of silver, but maybe not perfectly silver, but it's pretty good. A lot better than nothing. It's not anywhere close to being sugared or granulated, but it's not as good, maybe, as perfect as an argon purge would be. So I think that was okay for the application. This thing's going to have basically just water running through it, and it's a cooling manifold that just sends water to a bunch of injection or blow molds or whatever. So that's the part I was doing. I did purge portions of it because the end caps that welded on, I couldn't get backing on because it was closing the thing up. So... It generated some discussion and questions on YouTube, like, why didn't you purge the brackets? Or, I think you should have purged the whole thing, or things like that. Having done a lot of stainless pipe welding over my career, and also a lot of uh, aerospace work, and even welding titanium inside a chamber, I can speak a little bit to purging. I'm not the, I'm not the be-all, end-all expert of it, but I think between the three of us, with the experiences that we've had, we can definitely add to the conversation. I say stick with the hashtag... Hashtag back purge everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, 
before I did work with the airline maintenance, I didn't really realize that you could use aluminum and copper for backing and still get pretty good results on a lot of things. And in airline maintenance, it's used a lot. Like you have a lot of these little sheet metal hot section parts that are nickel alloy. And so really, you know, they need, they need something on the backside. But short of welding them inside of an argon chamber, there's no way of getting it because it's these little louvers that are only maybe spaced about maybe, you know, 30 thousandths of an inch from the other louver, and they're cracked. Basically, you hammer out a little copper sheet, form it, and it's a little backing material, and you groove out the crack with a grinder or burr, and you slip that copper backing up in, inside there, and you weld it up. And, man, that it worked. like It worked like gangbusters. That was the normal way of fixing that particular part. And there were many other parts where you had an expansion fixture where you were just jacking something out to resize it, and you had all these tiny little cracks that you had to re-weld, and you were just welding up against steel, like like coated 4140 steel. That was your backing. And when you got done welding, you looked at the back side, and it really looked like it was purged with argon because there was just nowhere for the for oxygen to really contaminate the back side. It was just like smashed up against this thing that was expanding it out. All I know is it worked. I'm not saying it's better or worse than argon backing or whatever, but it was just an eye-opener for me seeing all that go on. So I'm like, well... And then I couple that with the fact that as a pipe fitter, the process piping code for like power plants is B31.1, ANSI B31.1. It allows somewhere close to 2% of oxygen content before you could weld a stainless steel pipe weld. Well, 2% or even 1.5%, that's 15, 1.5% is 15,000 parts per million. That'll give you a black root. It won't sugar, but it'll be black. There'll be no color to it at all. And that was acceptable for stainless steel piping in that application. So like, well, hmm, how can that be? So anyway, I just want I just want to hey, let's talk about this. You know, is it is it absolutely necessary to have a silver backside? It is in some applications, like you wouldn't want pharmaceutical pro- products going through something that was had a black root on it. It needs to be a silver root. But does everything need to be? I know this is gonna be controversial, but hey, let's talk about it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> First thing that comes to my mind is like your stainless exhaust, your aftermarket exhaust for vehicles. Mm-hmm. It seems like from the manufacturers that, that is almost never purged. Mm-hmm. However, you know there are tricks that they, I guess, do or have um, to so it doesn't like blow through the backside and sugar really bad. I was watched in one part, and they were like, at, I don't even know what it was, 4,000 um, pulses per second, something. And you look at the backside, and it looked like it had a had a decent purge, but there's no purge there whatsoever. It was all in their settings and their tricks. And I know there's some pretty big names in the automotive world. They use mainly MIG, and the backside's not purged. And some of the headers, you know, they're TIG welded. They're not purged. And that seems to be an industry acceptance or, you know, all right. And I've asked them, you know, why don't you do it? Well, you know, the money, obviously, is the first thing. And a lot of time, but it seems to work. And it depends on who you ask whether or not that's a good idea or not. And what I mean by that is some guys will tell you that they'll crack over time. And I think it depends on how much heat, how much horsepower, and where that weld is relative to the motor. Some guys say they last forever. So that's a huge controversy. And that's the first thing that pops in my mind when we talk about should you purge or shouldn't you purge. Yeah, I remember there was a guy that I met in a training class years ago when he was making some exhaust components for little tuner cars. That topic came up with him. He was welding like carbon steel flanges to stainless steel pipe, and he was just using carbon steel MIG for doing that. And he's like, never had a problem. So I'm thinking, well, that may be this case, but let's look at the industry you're in. You're you're talking about tuner cars. Do people drive tuner cars for 300,000 miles in 20 years? Maybe sometimes, but typically I think it probably change hands every couple of years, you know, and they get tired of them or change motors out or blow the motor because they're because, you know, they're running them hard and they're putting turbos on them and right. all that change, swapping motors out left and right and all that. So it's hard, to, it's hard to say. It's hard to have a definitive answer for every industry out there. Sometimes it doesn't really cost much more to purge, but people just don't do it because they think it does. Right. You know, I mean, like if you're talking about a set of headers, if you had the right tooling and the right fixturing and you could you'd probably get a purge on that thing in five minutes and then you could just go to town on it, you know. Right. I'm working with a company right now, you know, consulting with them. They do uh, custom turbo applications. And I mean, I don't know if you guys, you know, 2JZ 2JZ swaps and all kinds of weird 
off the wall configurations. Motors that didn't come in these cars. But anyways, they're ma- they're making their own stainless manifolds, and I'm consulting with them partially as a friend and in return help with the motor build for me and helping them set up all their purge for these manifolds are building my argument to them is this if you purge it 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 doesn't cost that much to do it and you guys are so concerned about port and polish and everything i mean some of the things i'm watching them port and polish to improve airflow and everything it's like really that's like what are you really gaining by doing that and if you purge a manifold your weld on the inside should be a little bit smoother than if you completely sugared it on the inside now some guys don't penetrate 100 percent through so that won't sugar some of them are using like these schedule 40 elbows and they're not blowing all the way through not everybody is but some of them aren't and i don't know i would think that at the end of the day it welds better with a purge so why not you know uh, but does, I don't, i'm not it I'm does not weld better almost everything welds better with a purge if you're penetrating all the way through like you could even be just doing a, a square tube and miter joint you know and once you once you penetrate through you know it Oh, yeah. you know, that puddle starts acting squirrely, and you know you, you really want to you, you want to get ahead of it once that happens. But you know if you got the purge going, then everything's cool. No matter if you nip it, penetrate. Even if you don't have to penetrate all the way through. And I'm thinking when I say this, I'm thinking about that, like a a sample that Roy welded when I was at his shop one day. You know, a, a 45 miter joint on like inch and a half stainless square tubing. But you know you're gonna nip it. You're gonna nip through if you're not careful sometimes. And uh, you know it when you do, but if you got a purge on it, you, it well, it's great. Right. But maybe you don't. So maybe your your whole technique is to not nip through, and and that's what some of the some of the exhaust guys do. They like you said, they have it set up with a a, a program that that is sort of designed to just almost or just barely penetrate through, and in which case you probably won't sugar. You know, you just have a little bit of discoloration. So you know, you know, as we all know, that's only as good as the fit up. If you got this least little bit of gap, you're gonna penetrate through, and then you're gonna have a, a booger, sugar right. material, and then that's that's not good for flow or for longevity as far as you know fatigue properties. That's the thing is that, you know these are turbo motors that are running like the one is 700 and I think 707 horsepower an LS motor, and you know they're building the, their stainless manifolds, and it's like well, wouldn't you want that to be purged because you know you got a lot of heat going on right there, and but. These guys aren't running these motors for more than a couple years at the very most. So, I don't know. I guess you can argue either way. I think if nothing else, like you were talking about with grinding it all out and polishing it, it would make that job a hundred times easier. You know, because then, yeah. you know, you've got a hundred percent penetration with a nice smooth weld on the inside. You just polish it right off and you're good to go. And if it's all sugared and boogered on the inside... You don't know if there's pits and pores and how deep do those go. You know, it's like, why not? Right. I mean, I've seen purchased stainless products for manifolds. I have one in my garage now. I got a remake for somebody that no purge whatsoever, and it's black on the inside. And it's like, really? That's the way you guys weld these, huh? <laughs> but to each their own, I guess. I mean, some people. I'm sure there's some people out there that are just getting started at this, and maybe they don't have either a dual regulator or, or a Y set up to purge, and you know they just do the best they can. But And there's other products out there that you can use uh, that we've probably mentioned in the past off and on that can help you with that sugaring. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of the guys in – or I shouldn't say a lot, but maybe some of the guys in the auto industry – uh, whether aftermarket or OEM, maybe they just don't really care, or maybe there's something we don't know. <laughs> Somebody doesn't care. Somebody, you know, it might not be the welder himself. And he just may be following orders, and, and and the boss man's like, "What are you doing, purging that thing? We you, you, we don't do that. You know, we got to make a profit here. Right. Weld that thing. Get it out of here. Get it out the door. You know, and and so, but somebody doesn't really. Uh, I don't know. It, it is one of those things. It's kind of like for the little bit. For the one, a lot of times it's a one-time tooling cost, you know, to, to figure out some way of creating a, some type of fixture where it's very easy just to plug every, all the ports, turn the purge on, wait however many minutes, depending on the total cubic feet and the configuration of it, and then start welding. And uh, a lot of times it's not that much extra, but it, it just the perception is it costs a lot of extra. I mean, shoot, I worked for a guy one time. He he wanted to MIG everything that even stuff that should have been TIG because he was just all about the bottom line, the bottom line. And there were so many jobs that were actually better and faster to TIG them 
when you considered all the cleanup and everything involved. But he didn't see it that way. He's like, pull the trigger on that MIG gun whenever you can. And it's just not the way it is. So it's the same with Purge. It just doesn't always take longer. It doesn't always cost more. Sometimes it, it's a wash and you get a better product at the end. But it really does depend on, is it really necessary? And that brings me to Mike Zancanato. <laughs> you know, we had, we, he's a bike builder for everybody that hadn't heard that episode. And, and he purges carbon steel, Docal R8. He purges 4130. He purges titanium, of course. But he purges stuff that a lot of people wouldn't purge just because he likes the way it welds and it gives him peace of mind. He's all about quality, you know. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's a lot to be said for that. Everything doesn't need to be purged, but um, some things definitely need to be purged. Yeah. Right. Now, I get asked quite a bit on Instagram. I'll, I'll get DMs. What are your guys' thoughts on purging aluminum? I well, can't say I've ever done it, honestly. I think in some cases it's better not to. I'm just going by, we did it on our testing for the airline. We used purge fixtures for our aluminum tests. Um, it actually helped wet in on even on the fillet weld it helped wet that you know root pass in when you had backing on that side or argon backing you know a little little bit of flow rate going there you could tell a difference in the way it wet into the root but on the butt joints it made a little difference in the surface texture of the root and it seemed to improve x-ray results but i've seen x-ray results go through without argon as well Mm -hmm. so that wasn't the be all end all i don't i think for piping if the joint configuration is set up right, a lot of times for aluminum piping, there's a different joint configuration to where it's kind of like a J bevel to where there's no gap and you're just kind of like, it's almost like a eighth inch butt joint or something for that first pass. A lot of times argon is not used for that, even for x-ray applications, and it comes out fine. But it, you really do have to take care on your fit up and on your prep and on your abrasives and, and filing and, you know, it's it's a... It's almost a surgical operation. You you don't want to just like you can't just throw a big carborundum disc on that thing and then expect the root pass to come out okay. You're gonna have porosity if you don't do things right. So a lot of filing, a lot of cleaning with solvents and you know, good good fit up and you gotta take a lot of care. But I've seen it done without an argon purge on X ray joints. I don't think I've ever really purged an aluminum part and the only reason I think I would maybe consider it would be if I had to control the depth of penetration on something and you can use the pressure inside to kind of almost hold your weld a little bit. You know what I mean? True. Yeah, I do. I do. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it really doesn't need it. My answer to everyone whenever I have that question is you don't really have to, but it's not going to hurt if you do. If it's something you want to do, go right ahead. It's only better, but... It's not necessary. Yeah. You've taken, like, aluminum fillet weld tests in fairly recent history, right, Roy? Not aluminum fillets, stainless fillets. The only aluminum tests I've taken were butt welds, and we didn't purge those. We had a a copper capture block on the bottom that had a little groove cut out of it. Basically, the puddle would just kind of drop down into that and form as you're going along. So it would gotcha. just rest right in that copper, but there was no argon flowing in there. Cheater. So on a, <clears> hey, <throat> you know. <laughs> on, a, on a fillet weld, you know, like say, picture in your mind's eye uh, an eighth of an inch thick T-joint fillet weld. Maybe that's not the best example. Maybe go, go a little bit thinner, but let's just stick with eighth of an inch. You know, there's a little reluctance for it to go wet all the way into the corner. you got to make it kind of go there. I mean, you can easily kind of bridge the gap and get a horseshoe-shaped puddle, and you're like, I don't think I'm quite getting into that root all the way down in there. Well, if you're taking a test, that's kind of like the test. That's the test is getting all the way into that root, getting full penetration. You don't have to go much more than that, but you do need to – just for the sake of, you know, not barely passing, you want to you want to make sure that puddle is going all the way into that root. You can tell a difference when you have argon on the backside as opposed to not. You know, you kind of really got to make it like mind over matter almost. You got to make it go in there without argon and with it, it kind of wants to wet in there a little bit better like a like almost like a braze joint when you got a good clean joint with flux and everything, it wets in there. It just kind of flows in there with with argon. It's a little subtle difference, but it's a difference, nonetheless. Got to give it a try. I mean, in theory, you know, the aluminum is still oxidized, you know, when it hits the atmosphere. So I could see it being a, a benefit. Mm-hmm. 
So let's talk about what I mean. We we seem to be focusing on. I think in our minds when we started this conversation, we we're thinking about stainless steel. But what kind of things would need a purge, and what probably wouldn't? Let's kind of talk about that a little bit. Well, at my last job in Florida, we made a lot of stuff for the food and pharmaceutical industry. They didn't end up purging. Only thing they would purge was anything that was sanitary, like going to uh, 3A dairy plants and stuff like that. So a lot of it they didn't purge, and we started kind of pushing back a little bit, a few of us, and started making purge blocks for, like, the the boxes and things that we were making where we'd clamp it up and actually have argon flowing through the the block. And uh, the hand finishers were like, Man, these things are so much easier to clean up when you whatever you guys are doing different. These are great. And the management there still just wouldn't really listen even though you showed them night and day differences, but because they'd been doing it for so long with like a just an outside corner joint on probably like 11 gauge stainless, they they would just weld it up and then wire brush it on the inside and call it good if it didn't need to be fused, but a lot of times it needed to be fused on the inside, so it's like if you guys can purge it on the inside, it welds so much nicer. Mm. It At least block it with aluminum. That made it where it was about, I'd say, 75% better. It wasn't as nice, but it was definitely a lot better than nothing. Yeah. A lot of it depends on how tight you can get it clamped up, too, because sometimes oh, yeah. if you can get it just, like, clamped up, jam up and jelly tight with a block of aluminum, then if you have to come back over it and weld on that backside, that might otherwise be just black and oxidation and then, then the puddle flows like crap oh, yeah. the, puddle might, the puddle might flow great you know afterwards or if you, like i said if you have something even better a, a block with some alum, uh, argon ports in it well then fusing back over that is just like cake and everybody's happy you're happy as a welder and the finisher is happy because it takes him two seconds to finish it you know yeah and then i would even when i'd go to fuse the inside i would take that argon block and put it on the outside so that weld on the outside is getting purged somewhat from that block and then up on the table and just fuse it on the outside. So if you burn through, you didn't sugar the outside, which was always a real big problem they had there. Yeah. But on the big frames that we made, we didn't purge anything. It was all like eighth inch, two by two stainless tubing or inch and a half tubing. And none of that got purged because it was all on the inside and none of the products would ever touch anything. So they didn't see the need to purge all of that. That would have been quite the undertaking to <laughs> purge everything on those. Yeah. And, and so just to clarify, you're building some kind of frame for something, but it's square tubing. So it's all sealed up. And so the backside, so like you, let's say, for instance, you're building a frame, um, a rectangular or a square frame, and it's all square tubing. And you're, you're talking about mitered cuts, good fit ups and all that. So you're welding it all up. And the only thing that they're concerned about is exposure to whatever product is the outside of it. So on the inside, no one's ever going to see or touch that. So you know, like you said, in order to purge that, you'd pretty much have to drill purge holes and ports and then and then zip them up at the end of it, you know, or something. And But why would you do that? Because this part's got a life cycle. It's going to be good for X amount of years. Like I said, it's sealed up. Nothing's going to be – it's not going to be exposed to any – corrosive atmosphere or any food product on the inside of that square tubing so it kind of would have been unreasonable to think that you would need to purge that i think anyway yeah there was a couple frames that we had that were actually hypoallergenic or something frames and they were usually solid three inch solid bar wow yeah those were fun to, to weld <laughs> out like this you one get a, little, get a hernia uh, working with those. <laughs> yeah, there's one little frame that's on your table. You need a crane to get it off because the thing weighs 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. So there are, you know, when you're talking about carbon steel, gosh, when I was in school, for some reason we were doing 6G uh, pipe tests. For some reason we were purging that out. I think they were just trying to teach purging. I don't know because I never did purge carbon steel pipe on a job ever. But in school, for some reason we did. And so it's hardly ever done because it's just not necessary for carbon steel. But there are certain, like, uh, I forget what they call them, you know, chrome steel or whatever, that have maybe, once it gets to a certain percentage of chromium, 
then it does require a purge. And this is all listed in code books and everything like that, but I, I forget what the percentage is. But chromium seems to be the main factor in whether or not something is re- requiring a purge. You know, and 300 stainless has a roughly 18% chromium, and, and that's why it sugars and granulates on the backside. But there are other alloys, too, that some 400 series stainless steels that have around 12 and upwards percent chromium that that definitely benefit from a purge on the backside. I know we purged 410 stainless steel routinely in the aircraft industry and in maintenance, you know. Did a lot of 410 stainless. Tons of Pratt & Whitney parts are made of 410 stainless steel and always purge it. So there are some things that can benefit from purge a lot, a lot of things when you're talking about aircraft work. And like you said, like like uh, you guys said earlier, it never hurts. Yeah. You know, so when in doubt, purge definitely. Especially if it's right. a, if it's a thin part, definitely purge mm-hmm. it. And oh, at my job I have now, everything is purged. It's all three forty seven stainless and mm-hmm. a few other things and some ink and and all that. But everything we have it purged. Yep. In, in aircraft, you got seven basic groups, and they break them down into part A and part B on some of those. But you have you have carbon and low alloy. You have stainless steel. You have nickel. You have aluminum, magnesium, titanium, and cobalt. They don't really address copper alloys much in aircraft in that specific code. But we basically, um, you know, like say aluminum and magnesium, a whole lot of that work was uh, castings. But there was some ducting. There were some anti-ice ducts made out of magnesium, and there was some plenty of ducting made out of aluminum, and we purged it because it was thin wall stuff. The root pass, the penetration side came out a lot better. But on the castings, you know, they were so thick, you were just hogging out cracks and stuff. There was no need to purge that, you know, because you weren't penetrating through the backside a lot. So right. you really kind of got to have a little bit of understanding on why you're purging and what the end result needs to be and all that before you really know what needs to be purged and what doesn't. Right. What kind of tools do you guys use to purge or like good, good tools to suggest to have on hand if you want to get into purging stuff? Well, I've got a dual flow meter regulator that I've had for a long time that I've kind of retired because it's got some dry rot cracking on it. (laughs) And I suspect it's leaking because it's given, you know, I've had a few issues. So I've kind of like, oh, you know what? I've got several bottles of argon. There's no need for me to have a dual flow meter regulator. I'll just get a separate bottle of argon and use that for my purge. That's what I do now. But when I just had one bottle of argon, I, I, when I first got started, I used that. Uh, it was a Victor dual flow meter regulator, and it was kind of pricey. It was close to 200 bucks back in, back in the 90s, you know. Um, and I would use probably not the proper thing to use, but I would use automotive vacuum line because that's, that's what we were using on the job for a lot of our purging stuff. And it was just this either quarter inch or five sixteenths. It would slip right over a barb fitting without having to have a clamp on it. And then I would just hook it up to whatever purge device I was using, whether it was a homemade backup box used, made out of, uh, fabricated out of perforated copper or whatever. And there's lots of things, lots of ways you can make them. Delta had this habit of using perforated copper uh, for all these little odd-shaped backup boxes. And, you know, it wouldn't be uncommon for a guy to take a whole day, get a certain job in, take a whole day to stop and make a little purge box for the backside of this odd-shaped thing just to get good shielding on the backside. And, of course, then the next time the thing came in, you'd have it in your box, you know, ready to go. But it was perfectly acceptable to stop what you were doing and make a backup box specific to the job that you were doing. And again, we, we just use quarter inch stainless tubing for the inlet. And then we put little, uh, we put the automotive uh, vacuum line, which was very flexible as rubber, not the best thing to use because for certain material types, it, it can have a little O2 content and because it's kind of porous, but for most jobs like stainless and nickel, it was fine. So it would just slip right over that quarter-inch tubing without having to have any kind of clamp or anything, and then it would slip right over the barb fitting on whatever flow meter you were using. And oftentimes we'd have a little separate valve for the purge gas set up in your booth, turn it on, and and the benefit of that was you immediately had a purge. There was no wait time at all. For a backup box like that, as opposed to purging out like three foot of of one-foot diameter pipe or something where you have to wait a few minutes, with a backup box, you turn the gas on, you can strike an arc right then. That's a benefit. But that's what we used. I know a lot of people use 
I've seen Jonathan post some things about fabricating a little fixture for an inside penetration of an outside corner joint. So I'll let him talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I found that for that specifically, what works really good is take a piece of, of uh, aluminum angle iron, a uh, quarter inch thick. I mean, it could be any size on the legs, but quarter inch thick. And then if you have a machine, if you're a machinist, you can machine down the edge, outside edge, flat and drill holes in there. And then I take either steel wool or stainless steel wool. Stainless steel wool you can get on eBay. Uh, there's arguments out there about impregnating carbon through the argon and all of this nonsense and whatever. If you're doing high-end stuff, I suppose that's you know something to be aware of. But regardless, put some steel wool in there or stainless steel wool uh, or copper wool or whatever you can get. And that just helps disperse the argon in there, seal it up, put a whatever type of fitting on the backside, and now you have a backup box that you can use, you know, for, with argon uh, on the outside or the inside. Of, sorry, the inside corners of like pans and anything really. The only drawback to that is with those holes, with that flat and those holes, is you will see where those holes are. You know, where the argon's coming out of the hole, it'll be perfectly silver. If you don't have it tight enough in there. And in between those holes, sometimes you'll see just a little, little bit of coloring. Um, and that may or may not be a big deal. I use them mainly on stainless drip pans. So it doesn't really make much of a difference. It's catching whatever. Um, but if you're you know doing something else more high end, I think I would make it to where you have like a stainless or a, a wool or something to where it disperses the argon you know better before it hits the backside of your weld. But I've even used, like, for inside of pipes, um, another cheap way to do it, economical way to do it, is to get the little air mufflers that they sell. I know Parker sells them for, like, I don't think the quarter-inch ones are 5 10 bucks, something like that. It's a little brass perforated air muffler things, and you, know, you can put them on the end of your fitting, shove them in the inside of your pipe. You know, the theory is that that will help disperse inside of your pipe instead of being a directional. You know, a lot of guys shove their hose up inside of there with nothing on the end of it and tape it shut. And again, you can get into the theories of purging, you know, whether or not they create some turbulence and creates all these other problems. But those little air mufflers work, uh, work really good. I've not finished one yet, but the center, same type of thing, the centered bronze, uh, you can buy online. They're pretty pricey and you can make your own. You know, anything, any shape that you want. The problem is you have to be careful not to buy the impregnated oil ones. <laughs> yeah. those, would, those aren't so good, and that's the most common. So if you're on eBay, you're like, oh, Jonathan said buy some centered bronze. We can make this uh, purge fixture. Most of them are impregnated with oils, um, so just be careful with that. But if you can find the ones without them, use those. They work really, really well. Yeah, I've found like on making like that fixture you're, that I saw you post on Instagram a while back, Jonathan, the that aluminum purge box for the penetration side of an outside corner joint. Mm -hmm. If I was making that, a lot of times I would use copper wool, fill it up with copper wool, and then I would I would probably use a piece of uh, stainless tubing, go in the whole length of it, and then I'm, my holes in the stainless tubing would be facing backwards, where it would have to disperse and, and diffuse through that wool to get back out the exit holes. Right. You know, and, and that's the way we usually made backup boxes. And, and when you go to the, all that effort, a lot of times you pre got pretty even flow coming out the holes, but you know, not being a expert in uh, flow dynamics or whatever you call it. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a way to space holes and there's a scientific way to do it. And I just, a lot of times went by trial and error, you know, and I, I'd, I'd put it on a test part. If it wasn't right, I would modify it. I'd have it all tacked up. And if it didn't come out right, I'd drill some more holes or change the spacing of the holes or do something till I, till I did get it to come out right, you know, and then it would be good to go from now on. You right. Know? And it's, I've done the same, you know, thing, same thing, a lot of testing uh, with purging in the, in the past couple of years. And I, there's no way I claim to be an expert. I'm sure people listening to this or have a lot more years experience with back purging than I do. But I mean, it's interesting once you get into testing different configurations, different theories, um, trailing shields. Um, you know, I've made some trailing shields. Some I've not shown one of not, I've never shown and, uh, it works phenomenally great. And if I can get it, I'm not going to manufacture anything, but you know, if I could get it, it perfected even more and get some machine done with it um, in my opinion it outdoes some of the commercially available ones um, yeah but it's based off of tearing other ones apart 
and looking at what you got, it's like, okay, you know, this company sells like a trailing shield, let's just say, like this, and here's what's inside of it. Okay, so how do we make it better and how do we improve it? Um, you know, that's it is purging. That's on the outside purging. I've even made um, copper fixtures that are just solid copper bar, and not everybody can access that right off the bat. And if you think you can't, just go to Big Master Car or any any company like that. They sell copper bars. They're not cheap at all. But I've taken copper bar and drilled through the end, drilled holes, and done the same exact thing. And, you know, it works pretty good. You know, the copper sucks the heat out, and then you have the benefit of having a purge on the backside. And I've also made that purge fixture that I have and we use in our training classes. And, you know, that works really well. I'd like to improve on that a little bit better. But, you know, so far as the backside of that, you know, that, that purges really well and goes back to the way that I have it dispersing based off of what I've seen in industry. And, I mean, you can, you can go on Instagram even and type in back purge or hashtag back, back purge or back purging, back purge anything, all these different back purge hashtags and look at all the different products that are out there. But mostly the homemade configurations that guys have made. Every time I see one, I either screenshot it or save it because it's like, oh, I might want to remember that in the future. Make something similar to that because, man, there are people out there who are just geniuses. Like, why didn't I think of that, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And just for anyone that might be listening that doesn't know what a trailing shield is, it's actually something that hooks onto your torch and is about, you know, you can make them about an inch long or five inches long, however you need it, but it has argon flowing through it. So it's as you're welding along, your red hot puddle moves past your cup, but it's still covered underneath that trailing shield of gas. So it gives it that extra, however long, three or four inches of extra coverage. So you don't have to, like if you're doing a titanium part or something, you most likely wouldn't have to weld it in the chamber because it's going to be covered up and it's just a it's they're fun fun things to have and i've actually seen people make them out of uh, high temp duct tape and some screens and the stainless wool that they mess up in there and then it just have an extra gas line and it just zip lines around your torch and off you go and it works great Mm mm-hmm I've seen a lot of variations, a lot of different designs of trailing shields. Um, seen oversized cups machined out of Teflon mm-hmm. and all kinds of things like that. And, hey, if it works, it works. You know, it's just hard to argue with results, really, at the end of the day. But, you know, it's just kind of testament to the creativity of welders. You know, when you see all these different shaped backup boxes and different shaped trailing shields and they're, you know, it's not like all for pipe. It's not all for aerospace. It's just like for one specific application that was given a guy a freaking headache and he decided to stop what he was doing and take a few minutes or hours to make a one-time thing that was then going to make life easier from then on out. You know, and yeah. that's the name of the game, really. And then with that, too... If you're wanting to kind of broaden your toolbox a little bit, just go ahead and make some stuff. I mean, just try it. Make a drill a block like we're talking about. Put holes in it. And, you know, when when that job comes around, you know, how many times do you have to do an outside corner on a, a sheet metal part? It's a pretty common thing. So having that in your box just to clamp up, it's really handy to have. But another thing that's really handy to do is if you're going to Home Depot or Lowe's or a hardware store, Stop over in their little tubing fitting section and just look at what they have. And once you start getting into like the purge lines and the Y's and the T's and all that stuff, you're just looking at what they have. You can kind of get an idea of what you could possibly do in the future. And I just buy a couple barb fittings here and there, have a couple drawers in your toolbox or like a little organizer or something just full of random stuff because you never know when you might need a a T because you have to purge in like three different areas or something off of one line. So when you can just turn around to your box and it's right there, it's a really handy thing to have. Yeah, true. I agree. And more yes. fittings you got, the better off you are. Definitely get some get some uh, of those little nylon or plastic or whatever they're made out of, the, the Y barb fittings, because there's going to be those times when you have to purge more things than you have flow meters, you know, oh, yeah. and you have to Y off, you know. If you think about, like, say, titanium needs purging everywhere. Even a simple T-joint in titanium, you have to purge the, the underside 
and the back side, and you have to get good purge on your cup side. And um, automatically, you got to have a Y to get the basic minimum purge on a titanium joint, where you could probably get by with just one thing on on stainless, maybe, but or maybe not. I don't know, but. It's a good idea for as cheap as they are just to get a handful of those little barb fitting Ys at Home Depot or any big box store like that or just order them on Amazon, keeping your toolbox like that. And, and again, those <laughs> that automotive uh, vacuum line that we used, actually, it's not really good for titanium as far as the parts per million and everything, but for almost everything else, it, it works fine, and it's really handy. I would stay away from the plastic as much as you can once you get into the high-end stuff. Just I'll throw that out there. Plastic wise, you mean? Any anything plastic. For the sake of not purging properly or just not, not being durable or what? Not purging properly. Once gotcha. you get into, you know, the low, low parts per million and you start you get into cleanliness and whatnot, yeah. Plastic can mess with you. But, you know, for a, a stainless joint that just, you know, improve maybe maybe you had a stainless joint that you didn't purge before and you want to purge it this time and all you have is a stainless uh, a plastic why go for it um, because sta- stainless isn't quite the same as titanium when you get down right. there. i'm just throwing it out no, there like, I don't like, like, who- like i said earlier you know the stainless the code the b311 code is like i've seen some stuff that said two percent i want to i remember one and a half percent but one and a half percent like i said fifteen thousand parts per million and to weld titanium successfully you're you're you're, you've done a lot of work with huntington fusion jonathan so you know you can speak to that the parts per million versus fifteen thousand versus what's acceptable for titanium huge difference right you you, you know get you get it below 100 parts per million or or less yeah you start to see i mean anything above zero you really start to see you know a difference but especially 10 20 20 parts per million you start to see you know a little bit of coloration but Anyways, that gets into a deeper theory there. But I'm just I'm just yeah. be be careful with plastic because even in purge chambers, plastic can off gas and uh it's not a not a good thing. But So you, you know, recommend for, brass? I would stick with brass. I would stick with brass and copper or stainless. Gotcha. Yeah, and then if you're doing something that's just kinda down and dirty and you gotta just come up with something really quick, and that's usually where I'm at. Aluminum foil and blue Blue painter's tape. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it works great. You know, it, it, and the best part is when you're standing in front of an engineer and they're scratching their head trying to figure out how we can, we can purge this without making anything. And I'm like, you got any aluminum foil? And they look at you like, what are you talking about? I'm like, just get me a roll of <laughs> aluminum foil and some tape and go away. <laughs> you know, they're just like, why do uh-huh. you want aluminum foil? It's like, why do I have to explain it? Just, I'm, I know what I'm doing. Just go get it. You know, and then yep. they come back with a roll of aluminum foil and it, it's great because it's moldable. It's fairly, you know, you can fold it over and make it four, five, six layers thick. So it's durable. You can use it multiple times for the same part. The blue painter's tape doesn't really stick, but it will melt. So don't get it too close to the, where you're going to weld at. Um, yeah. But it works great. And in a pinch, it'll really save you. Right, so I've seen it, really it used will. on the inside, inside and outside. I've seen guys make trailing shields for oh, yeah. the outside with that, and I've seen guys, you know, making like an in, you know, for the inside of their corner joint. You know, I've done it actually when I didn't have nothing else and I just, you know, a weird shape, make a dam with that aluminum foil, and off you go. You know, yeah. it's not perfect. I mean, it may not give you the absolute perfect um, purge, but it's <laughs> it's a lot better than nothing. When you think about, and you know, this is another good tip for everybody listening to this. Get you a, a roll, a full roll of heavy-duty aluminum foil, like the thick stuff, and just keep that. It'll probably last you for years, mm-hmm. but you'll figure out uses for it. And when I say that, I'm, I've even experimented with using it for a heat sink where you, you know, strip off like a whole, you know, several feet of it and then fold it, fold it, fold it, fold it, fold it, and make it – you know, maybe a half inch wide and a half inch thick. And then you wrap that around. You can wrap that around a piece of tube and, and put a zip tie or something on it on a stainless tube. And it's actually a heat sink, mm-hmm. you know, to, to, um, and you will improve your whole discoloration issue. It'll, if you got something next to it that you don't want to melt, it'll draw the heat out and you don't have to, you know, only weld for quarter inch and let it cool at a time. 
it's a very useful thing to have in your toolbox, not only for purging and, and taping off and using it for dams and everything, but for, you know, so what if you waste $5 worth of aluminum foil on a part that's worth $5,000 to make it come out better, you know? Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a very cheap thing to have in your toolbox, and you find all kinds of uses for it. I actually would buy the the big box of pre-cut aluminum foil at Sam's Club. You just Mm -hmm. pull it out like tissue paper, and it's usually pretty thin, so you have to kind of use three or four of them or something. But if you're doing repeating parts, too, I mean, like I said, you can kind of fold it and make it to where it's a little bit stronger, and then you can mold it right where you need it. And if you're careful with it and you pull it off gently, you can reuse that same one for, you know, five, six, seven parts, and if it'll start tearing up after a little bit, but it's definitely worth it. Yeah, it's still better than making the one-off thing out of duct tape time and time and time and time again and using it one time, you know. Mm -hmm. Even if you only use it five or ten times and it tears up, it still saves you time. But it's definitely worth having on hand for just lots of things. Like like I say, you don't have time to fabricate a backup box for this eight-inch backside of an outside corner joint. You got some aluminum foil and some painter's tape or whatever, and maybe even a piece of copper tubing, you know, to to slip up in there and then seal it all off you can you can make something happen another thing that it's a pretty good idea to have in your box if you're doing stuff where you're going to be like taping off things and you have to weld fairly close to it where the blue painter's tape is going to probably burn and or the the tape is going to not stick anymore because of the heat and then it's really fun when you're welding along and you think it's going good and it starts acting a little weird and you're like what's what's going on and then you stop and you realize that your purge dam that you made that you taped on fell off because it <laughs> the heat liquefied the glue on the tape so then it's no good anymore so i started mm-hmm. using the high temperature fiberglass tape if mm-hmm. i know that i'm going to be welding close to it and that stuff works great you know just 20 dollars or something on e- on amazon or you can find it on eBay, and just having a roll of that around has been really nice. Yeah, you know, that's another that comes to mind now that you say that, um, because in in aircraft work, and maybe even where you're working, Roy, the um, you know, I don't are there thermal spray operations going on where you're working? No, there there were there were where I was working. That was a department thermal spray. They did you know plasma spray, flame spray. A high velocity oxy fuel spray, and they would have to have these high temp tapes to mask off areas, you know, for that stuff. And it was, you know, shooting a high temperature flame there. And so uh, that was just masking, you know, it's kind of like painting. You had to have, you have to have lots of masking tape for painting, but this is high temperature stuff. And it was fiberglass tape. They have several different versions of it. And we wound up using a lot of that tape to tape off areas for purge and, and stuff like that. So, you don't even know it exists until you, you come across it or work somewhere where they're using it, but that stuff is handy. Yeah. Or the aluminum tape. Yeah. That works, too. Terrible when you melt the glue on that, but yeah. it it works, you know, <laughs> up until that point. It's a sticky mess. Yeah, it's not not a good thing. One thing, though, if you do melt the tape and it's still sticking on there, let the part cool down completely and the tape will come off a lot cleaner. Don't try to take it off while it's really hot. Then you have a gooey mess. So just an extra little tip. True. I used to listen to all kinds of uh, podcasts and things in the car, trying to learn how to make, make a go of having a business. And there was a guy that worked for this outfit called Asepco, and it was uh, they built valves for the pharmaceutical industry. And they had this guarantee that, you know, like if you can imagine – how much of if they had to dump a vat or a whatever container or whatever they had to dump a vat of Viagra or something, how many thousands of dollars that would cost a pharmaceutical company? And so a valve that they bought that they used for the for their processing, if it was suspect or contaminated the product in any way, that was a huge deal. And one of the ways this company got sort of a market share of the business was they had this ironclad guarantee where they said if if you have to lose product on account of our valve we'll we'll pay to come in and put the valve a new valve in plus we'll pay for the cost of the product and they had this like that was a huge guarantee but they had a really good process you know they had a good system where they they purged all their valve components and they you know they were very confident in their ability to produce a good product but 
I just thought that was interesting because when you think about pharmaceutical products, Imitrex and things that are $10 a pill, if you have to dump a vat of that stuff because of a bacteria forming in a valve, that's like could be a million dollars at the drop of a hat, you know. And so purging all of a sudden becomes, you know, a huge deal. And, and it is a huge deal, and especially in industries like pharmaceutical and food service. Yeah, that's when you start to get into purging down to parts per billion. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Maybe yeah. so. You know, you don't put the big lighter on there and call it good when it blows out the flame. <laughs> no, I would. That, I would anyway. Well, that's kind of always been a. I'm not going to call it a pet peeve, but I believe I've never done any testing on it. But I think probably one percent oxygen would still blow out a flame, and it'll also give you a black root. You know, that's not a good test. The 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 big lighter blowing out from the purge coming out the exit hole. That's not a good test. You got to have something a little better than that. Yeah, if you're getting into you know, this kind of stuff, you need to invest in a purge monitor and as well as all kinds of other stuff to make sure you're at the place you need to be in, on your purge. Uh, I've never actually done the Bic lighter test, but I've seen it done, and it's like it might be just fine for their applications, but part per million are you really at? And, again, it may or may not make any difference. But for pharmaceutical stuff, there's no way I would uh, – Mm-hmm. Well, you well, first off, you wouldn't be allowed to do that anyway. Everything's controlled. You know, you're you're taking a reading of everything that you're doing, and there's no way that's going to be allowed anyway. So we'll just get that right out out in the open, or, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, I'm going back to when I was in school, and I saw guys whip out the big lighter to test the purge. You know, coming out the you know they just put it up next to the joint or out the vent hole or whatever, and if it blow out the flame, they thought they were good to go. Well, if you're purging out of a coupon that's a total of six inches, unless you did a really shoddy job of taping it up and everything, you're pretty much going to have a purge in, in a minute, regardless what. But it, we, I just remember that. I remember the guys, you know, take, because, you know, about half the guys back then smoked, so they had a lighter on them. <laughs> they checked the purge. Oh, I'm good to go. Blew out the flame, you know. I'm like, and then later on, when I started learning more about it, I'm like, I referenced stainless pipe on a nuclear plant. We did have a purge meter. It didn't go into parts per million. But because our criteria was only like one and a half percent percentage, yeah, you know, for stainless pipe. And this was X-ray piping, you know, I mean, this is not like just, you know, drain lines or anything, but about one and a half percent. That was the criteria. And later on, when getting into more, you know, more exotic alloys and everything, then I got into purge meters and learned about parts per million and and things like that, because we actually welded some niobium material also called columbium which is very much welds like titanium but much higher melting point much more stringent on the purge requirements and we did that some of that at, at the airline you know and and uh so you kind of had to step up your game when you come to certain certain alloys that the big lighter thing would have been a joke there you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah really you get fired. Into parts for million yeah <laughs> If you discolored that at all, if if you had any any O2 at all in there, you, you could just hear it cracking as it cooled, you know. Yeah, and when it comes to purging, if you're ever questioning it, just walk away and go get a drink, come back, give it a couple more minutes, and you should be good. If it's a small part, you know, sit back for three or four minutes or something, and it's definitely purged out if it's, you know, can fit in your hand. You know, if you let it go for, it really probably only takes about 45 seconds or a minute to purge that out but if you do it if you let it go for another two minutes it only helps yeah and i'm thinking when when i'm thinking back like on the nuclear plants there there were times i mean a whole lot of the welding you were doing you're doing in in jack stands like you're welding a 90 onto a stick of pipe or something like that or you're making a spool assembly where you make maybe welding a couple of 90s and a couple of fittings and and then you're going to put it in place but there were times when you were making a tie-in and you you would uh, you might be purging a hundred foot of pipe with all kinds of different little vent holes and and uh, not vent holes but you know vents and little dips and things and and you know there were there were provisions sometimes where we used purge paper to limit the amount that we were purging is water soluble purge paper where you you know you could dam up like a foot away from the weld and and then uh, limit the amount of piping you were the square footage you were having to purge but sometimes you're making you're tying in and you're you're just purging a lot more than you really want to and then you get into all kind of like barely good enough and is there any water sitting in some sump or some low area of this line which 
And water is a whole other issue when it comes to purging. You know, you put a drop of water in a purge chamber, guess what? <laughs> you just threw a monkey wrench in the works. You know, your your water-cooled torch leaks a drop of water into your, if you're welding inside a purge chamber, you have a problem, you know. So if you have a little moisture in water in a piping system, you have the same issues. So I guess maybe that's where there are such lenient codes as far as the 1.5% thing, you know. But sometimes it's hard to get a purge when you're talking about tying in a line where you got a hundred foot on one side, a hundred foot on the other of this joint that you're welding. There are those situations and you start thinking about, well, let's see, that's a hundred foot of 12 inch pipe. How many cubic feet is that? I'm running, you know, 50 cubic feet per hour off my flow meter. So how long should that take to weld? And you have to do a little math mm -hmm. and then you need to have a purge meter also because the math doesn't always work out because you could have forgot to tape off a, a vent or a hole or you could be sucking air somewhere. And to be honest, to be get a good purge, to verify a good purge, you really need a purge meter. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. not a bad idea to have, if, especially if you're working for a big company. A lot of places, they like that, uh, my last job in Florida, they had no idea what I was talking about. When I said, you guys want to buy a purge monitor for these things? Because, you know, some of the guys, like you're saying, they'd be welding up some parts and they didn't tighten up a fitting or whatever, and it's just sucking air the whole time and then they weld it and mm -hmm. pull it out and it kind of purged but it wasn't that yeah. great i mean it all gets polished off on the inside but it's still a nightmare for the hand finishers it's like you know if you guys just spent some money and bought a purge monitor and we could use that then it, it eliminates all question yeah it, there are certain applications where there's just no real substitute for it. I mean, I have, I have a down and dirty trick or two in my up my sleeve, but the purge meter is the way to go. Especially if you're if being audited by any agencies or anything like that, you really need to be able to prove how you determined you had adequate purge while you welded the X part. You know, yeah. and the only way to do that is was with a purge monitor. Their favorite question with auditing is, "Well, how do you know? Yeah, how do you know this? Well, that how do you know that?" Now you can buy a monitor. I'm sure that they've been out forever, but who knows? But they re actually record everything. That'd yeah. Be, that'd be nice. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about so much proving out. You can record from your welder exactly where you're at so far as your welding procedure, and now you can record uh, your your purge. And so you can combine the two and say, here, you know, hand them a thumb drive or whatever you do. And you say, here's, here's, here's this weld that I did yesterday at 1 o'clock, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot. When you get down into that, there's a lot of things that affect. I, I learned a lot in the studies that I've done. Again, by no means an expert whatsoever. But it was amazing what actually affects a purge. We're talking down like one part per million um, or less. And, you know, I, I, was, I showed Roy. It was, it's been a while back now. I threw leather gloves in the purse chamber. At first, I didn't really like, think about it. And then once we got it in, Roy's like, you know, that's not going to work right. So I had the two purge monitors going. And when I would flex my hand, the monitor would jump mm -hmm. because it was releasing, you know, whatever was trapped inside that glove. Uh, plastic, if you, you had plastic in there, it seemed like you just could never could get a good purge if you moved it. You wouldn't get a good purge. Um, if you had two pieces of metal on top of one another and got a good purge and then moved one of them, you know, you released that atmosphere that was in, stuck inside of there and it would jump, you know, 20, 30, 40 parts per million. So you had to go wait till it go back down. It's, it's amazing. You move a valve or move anything that's in line with that. I still haven't figured out exactly what that is, but if you're, when you're purging and you like touch your, the handle on your bottle, and like move it just a little bit. That'll make your purge jump up and down or up and then, you know, settles back down. So when you get to that level, it's it gets pretty critical, which actually is pretty fun and frustrating at the same time. Yeah, unfortunately, you pretty much only need to, get, you know, get to that level for certain alloys. You know, again, the, the stainless steel code, you know, even on that nuclear plant, one and a half percent ish. That's pretty lenient for stainless, but and then and then you know I mentioned earlier what alloys require purge and what don't. So let me talk about that a little bit. You know, carbon steel alloys and low alloy steels like chrome moly, most of the time don't really require it, but it, it doesn't hurt. Stainless steel definitely need a purge. Nickel alloys 
probably more more stringent than stainless steel as far as the parts per million go. Aluminum, most of the time you don't need it. Same with magnesium. Titanium, definitely need it. More stringent than stainless steel or nickel. You're getting down into the parts per million, like below 100 parts per million there usually, depending on the joint configuration and depending on the application of, you know, is this a bike part? Is it a space shuttle part? Or is it a golf club? You know, it just depends. Right. And then, you know, there's cobalt alloys, which are a high heat resistant. They usually require purge as well. And then again, bottom line is usually never hurts to purge anything. But there are more stringent requirements for certain alloys than other. We haven't even got into like there are certain alloys like molybdenum and tantalum and all that, which are super refractory. They require a super high level of purge. But there's such rare, you know, rare birds that no, not much need in talking talking about them on this podcast. When you're listing off all those materials, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, if the stuff is really expensive. Purge it. Yes. Good point. <laughs> good point. Really. You know, that like is a good point. Every, you know, the more exotic stuff you get, the more likely it, it needs to be purged. Again, if you're doing that type of work and you're working with these crazy alloys, an extra tank of gas is nothing in the cost of welding it. So what does it hurt? Nothing. I mean, well really. spoken. Well said. That is a good point because most of the time the the reason for the increased cost is your elements like chromium and nickel and cobalt and molybdenum and the higher end alloys, which are all, all require a purge. Yep. We can't not talk about purging without at least discussing what a good purge looks like. Because maybe there's some some I'm sitting here thinking, okay, we cover all the basics here. We kind of went into areas that some probably will never touch. Um, but, you know, we got to talk about what a good purge looks like. And here's where you get into some arguments and theories. Um, you know, I know that there's color charts out there, and I've heard from industry experts all over the place that disagree and agree and say that, well, that color chart's great, but, you know, if you don't print it out right, then you can't do a, uh, an accurate color comparison, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to see what you guys think about. What would you say an acceptable purge looks like so far as coloring, texturing, anything? I'd say it depends on the alloy because yeah. if it's stainless steel, for instance, um, and, and, and not even the alloy, it depends on the alloy and the application because if it's stainless steel and it's just piping for uh, you know cooling water for a power plant, that's one thing. If it's stainless, same, same grade as stainless steel, if it's still like 304L, stainless steel but it's food grade to where it's a brewery or something then you're talking silver because you don't want any oxide layers there that can be just layers of uh porous material that bacteria can grow in mm -hmm. or, whereas bacteria on a cooling water on on a power plant maybe no one cares you know but it's a big deal on an ice cream plant an orange juice plant or brewery or something like that it's kind of a moving target as far as there's no single answer, but you want to shoot for silver. But there, I think there are definitely times when less than silver, like straw, purple, blue, even are acceptable on the backside of a purge on stainless steel. That's my opinion, anyway. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying that's 100 percent right across the board, but that's I'm basing that on my experience. I agree with that. You know, like you said, you're you're always shooting for silver. That's the ultimate goal, but like you said, if it doesn't really matter and if it ends up being straw or in the, the light blues and stuff, eh. but if it's something that's important, then yeah, you you definitely want to be in the silver and very light straw colors, no blue. Yeah, and you, if you get out of stainless steel and you're getting into titanium, it, it's still kind of the same because it really does depend on the like service requirements of the part you know i've always heard with titanium if it goes past a certain color in the heat affected zones it loses its tinsel strength properties so it actually weakens the part so that's why it's going to more likely fail and that's why you take the extra time and if you can't purge every little bit of it you put it in a purge chamber so you don't have to worry about all the little nooks and crannies that are heating up yeah, there's some truth to that. Again, there's there's also probably a few caveats to that, I, in my opinion. But there's a lot of truth to it as far as the discoloration. You know, it's definitely an indicator of the level of 
O2, nitrogen, hydrogen, whatever that was present when that thing was being welded. But then again, a lot of it depends on whether it was done in a chamber or not because you can have the same discoloration outside a chamber and inside a chamber, and you got a totally different scenario uh, that happened while that puddle was molten. Right. So, you know, um, like I said, you can't go wrong with silver on titanium, and that's what you should shoot for, definitely. But if you look at the D17 code or specification, which is for aerosp- aerospace and aircraft, there are criteria where it can be acceptable when it's blue and purple on the outside. So what do you do with that? If everybody's telling you need to be silver or straw, you know, it's a, (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) It's a, it's a deep, it's a deep subject. I'll throw one out for you also. It also depends on the cleanliness of your base metal. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because you can have the same, in my testing I did that should be published here soon, I would have to say, you know, we did some testing on the cleanliness of the base metal. And that made a big difference also. And it made also made a difference, Roy and Jody, on I can't speak to the strength of the titanium in the heat affected zone, but it does make a difference on the cleanliness of the titanium on whether or not you have anything, like a light, very, very light straw, maybe let's just say a half inch away from your weld zone or or not, depending on how clean your base metal actually was. Oh yeah. That's just something I found in my testing. Yeah, because all those contaminants that are on the part are going to burn from the heat of the metal it'll burn and then it'll like re-solidify down on the material and it's a nightmare after that especially if you're if you're trying to purge the inside of a tube or something and you didn't quite get all the cutting fluid out of it or there's someone else tacked it up and they've already got it all sealed up and they said here you go weld it and you know you just show up and then you you pull it all apart and you're like what the heck and, I mean, you can see, I've had it literally where I've, there's still, like, chips inside the part. And it's like, come on, really? You didn't even wipe out the chips and the oils and all that? I mean, like, well, we just thought, you know, just a little bit around, you know, about an inch away from the weld's good enough. It's like, no, the whole thing needed to be cleaned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, cleanliness is definitely key. Yep. Back in the day, you know, when... when uh was doing some titanium parts in a argon chamber. The repair procedure, the instructions were to, you know, put a sample piece of scrap titanium in there and purge it for X amount of time and then weld on this sample piece. And then when you got it to silver, then you're ready to weld on the actual part. And that's, you could tell a big difference there if you didn't clean your sample piece. I remember that. You know, if you didn't go to the effort of cleaning the sample piece, you could see some straw and stuff in the heat affected zone of the of your uh, of your sample test piece inside that chamber, and then you're kind of like, well, I wish I'd have cleaned that because now I got to wait an extra thirty minutes to, to make sure, you know. <laughs> right. But yeah. Cause... It's true. It's very true. You could tell big difference. Uh, you could just uh, there's stuff there. It, it could be oil. It could be it could be just a slight amount of something, humidity or anything. If you went to the care of of using a really clean abrasive, cleaning it, and then wiping it down with acetone, and and then putting it in there for a test piece, then then you were more confident when you got that silver, you know, than than you were otherwise. Even just a fingerprint on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, it, I mean, it it sounds like we're being super picky and overly detailed and all, but when you're working on a part that's probably ten thousand dollars might want to put some rubber gloves on to hold that thing because the fingerprint can outgas and it can ruin your purge and it can possibly ruin that part if you're not really careful so it's you know taking the time to do the extra little things and you know and you might be working on something that's you know not just a couple hundred dollars or just for a buddy or something if i know it's an important part for somebody i'll take the extra time and if i have the rubber gloves at home i'll put them on just so i don't get fingerprints all over the part you know and i hand it back to them and it's like this pristine looking thing and they're just like wow this looks great and it's yeah you know you take the extra time to do the small things and it makes the big things better in the long run yeah over the years we were lucky to have some experts come in and and give talks and seminars and things like that. And one one thing I remember was a guy from Polymet came in. Um, I think that was the it. I think that was it. He was, of course, Polymet's a manufacturer of uh, 
high-end aerospace filler metal materials, so they you can get any kind of any kind of alloy from them. They're not the only ones. There's a bunch of them, but they but they had you know they had some experts on board and they sent them in and talked to us. And I remember some stories that they talked about about some issues with things like fingerprints on titanium. And there was some issue. I don't remember the whole exact details. But it was a it was like a NASA issue, and there were a lot of women welders, and they they even went so far as to dig down to the fingerprints like a certain time of the month that they had this issue where <laughs> you know you see where i'm going with this <laughs> really <laughs> i know right but it was a it was a story hey, i'm just re- really in a story where there was you know it was like a certain time of the month that all these women welders just put more oil onto these parts and they had to really they had to go to cotton gloves or nitrile gloves or something like that you know um mm. it's just a story I- I believe just, it. I don't know if it's true or not. I'm just relaying. I'm just relaying the story that I was told. You know. I believe. I, don't know, I mean, I don't have any idea about that, but I believe. You know how picky. You know some of that stuff can be with outgassing. Um, I was in some of the stuff I was involved in a while back. You know, with some of the testing and reading emails and conversations with you know those I was working with, they went so far as to. You know, for certain tests, absolutely no aluminum allowed in the chamber. Because mm-hmm. the the oxide layer on aluminum is hydroscopic, and mm-hmm. they would off gas, you know, moisture. You know, I guess if you want easy explanation, it would off gas moisture into your chamber. And I'm like, seriously, that seems to be a little much. But supposedly, you know, it's true. Now, for those tests, I didn't have any aluminum in there. Some I do. I have some aluminum blocks in there, but they want everything stainless. And in fact, there was also argument. E- you know, again, we're talking like really, really critical stuff, and like way beyond what we would ever do in our garages. But you know, they didn't even want copper because there's an issue with copper. They want medical grade, pure stainless. Your reg from your bottle to your regulator to your lines all had to be clean. You know, it was just like seriously. It's interesting when you get to that far, but again, you they would argue. The argument went back to the very, very minimal effects that anything has oils water whatever has on the the weld quality but anyways i think got sidetracked a little bit on it on that but i guess i get i get a little i like to talk about purging because you know doing the testing that i i did for about a year a year and a half or something like that it, it was a real eye opener honestly and that's the emails i would send back to those i was doing the work for it's like man i've learned so much in purging this i don't do those practices uh, for you know these stainless drip pans because huh, I'm not going to waste my time. I, for those, it's bottom line dollar for me. I need to get them done, and you know they're drip pans. They don't care. They want them looking clean. They don't want no coloring on them or anything. But they don't really care if I, I had 100 parts per million or or one part per million on my back purge. But you know I know when I look at some of that stuff, it's like yeah I I know I could do this this and this and clean it this way and purge it this way and it would come out you know beautiful. But it takes a little bit extra time to get to that point also. But I agree also silver with the light straw so far as going back to the color and get to that. There is there are those out there that I've talked to that believe a blue is a nice color. Of course, there's also those out there that, that think that, you know, pink is a great color for like walking the cup on pipe. And I'm not going to argue and say it's a bad thing at all, but uh, stick as close to silver as you can and you should be fine. Yeah, you know, inside – of the pipe is different than outside of the pipe, especially like on sanitary tubing, because it's even acceptable to have some slightly concave weld. You're usually welding that thing without filler metal, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, uh, the main thing, the main, main thing is the inside surface contour purge quality and all that, because it's not, you're not really talking about pressure. You're not talking about thermal cycling. You're talking about cleanliness on the inside to prevent formation of critters and bacteria and stuff. That's right. the, that's your objective, you know. And so a lot of process piping, same way, you know, you get a good purge. Well, the outside could be, honestly, almost anything, you know, yeah. s- short of black and gray and be okay because that's not the thing, you know. I mean, then the, and then you can get into also, also not only discoloration, but you get into the whole carbide precipitation thing and but and, which is a right. whole you know it's a, a separate other, topic <laughs> it's a, it is a separate it's kind of related but it's this whole separate topic you know get into that we we talked a little bit about that when we had steve um auto no better on the, as far as the uh 
as guests, you know, when we talked about that a little bit. But And we'll get into it again, I'm sure, because it is a deep topic. But um, purge has to do with that, but different thing. But my mind goes so many places when we talk about purge because it is, you know, I'm, mine's, I'm, I'm going, I'm thinking about sanitary sanitary tubing for breweries and ice cream things and orange juice things and pharmaceutical things. And I'm also thinking about Mike Sanconato, well, in bicycles. And then I'm also thinking about things that I've purged, you know, 24, 36 inch stainless steel piping, the issues I had with that and the, and the, and the purge limitations that were there. Then I think about aerospace and using purge boxes and it's a deep topic. It is. <laughs> I don't think we can do it justice in one episode. So, no. you know, maybe we're, maybe we ran our course here for tonight. I don't know. Yeah. And you it's, get into, it is very deep. Yeah. You well, get into, you know, the, what part per million did you even get from the supplier that in the, in the bottle itself? Exactly. You know, there I, we notice the difference even with that. Typically, it's around two to five parts per million. Um, it should be what you get uh, when you order just a regular argon bottle. Uh, anything above that and is pretty abnormal. And uh, we did set bottles, um, and they were pretty expensive. We asked for certain parts per million, plus or minus. I forget the exact percent. A couple, couple parts per million, and you could tell. As you went up in the parts per million, even at 10 parts per million from in the bottle, you could tell the difference. Now, we're talking, again, purse chambers, titanium, super, super clean, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, again, it gets into it gets into a pretty deep topic. We'll definitely have to revisit this. We will because um, we'll learn more in between now and the next time we <laughs> revisit it. And, we, you know, there are, there are things like dew point and things like that that even throw a monkey wrench into the works mm-hmm. that we didn't even talk about. So um, as we learn more, maybe uh, maybe we'll have some other people weigh in on it, too, and, and uh, we'll drill down a little deeper. Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, one more little topic on it that I'd like to go over. Really, I don't know if it's really quick or not, but I know it would probably help everybody out there that wants to get into it and is doing it or whatever but what flow rate do you generally use when you're purging on the inside (laughs) here's where you get into a a big discussion argument honestly because a lot of industry experts and a lot of industry people that i've talked to it's like let's just say a chamber for you know so we have something in our mind so we're filling a, a purge chamber up some experts say five parts per million and let it fill up over a course of x amount of time some blast it full I've done it both ways, and I've never been, been successful at five parts per million. When it comes to like back parts, uh, back purging a small part for me, I, you know, I like just a little bit more flow. But you don't want too much. It depends on the joint configuration, honestly. Like like these pans, you run fifteen twenty CFH, and it's going to want to blow it back at you, and that's probably not a good thing, or it's not a good thing, I should say. I think it depends on what it is. But I don't know. What do you think, Jody? Before I go too deep in that. Well, you're on the right track, I think, because it definitely depends on what you're talking about. The last thing in recent memory I was purging was, you know, it was roughly one or two cubic feet. And so I had to purge, uh, my flow meter set at 10 CFH. And I don't want to go any higher than I need. Plus 10 CFH, if I'm talking about one cubic foot that I'm purging, if I'm 10 cubic feet per hour, then I should have that thing purged out in a few minutes, right? Just by the math. Right. If, I, if, I, if I'm not sucking air somewhere. And so, but if I go higher and I've got gaps, now I'm, now I'm fighting against my cup gas, my shielding gas from my cup versus the area, the, the argon that's blowing out of my gap, you know, it's creating turbulence in there and you can get problems and you can get porosity and it can be sucking air in there and messing up everything. So you, you gotta be reasonable. And you, you know, like you say, I, I usually like lick the back of my hand and kind of like feel, how much gas is coming out, where I'm going to be welding. And if I feel it too strong, I'll turn it down a little bit because I know I've just from, just from experience, if that thing is screaming out of there, out of that gap, and I've got say 15 or 20 CFH, depending on what kind of size cup I'm using, sometimes you light up and it's just like, it's just a mess. You know, it's just turbulence and you can see stuff, bad things happening there. So Mm -hmm. you kind of want to limit the, you want to have the minimum almost a little bit more than the minimum to require to purge the part that you're welding so that you don't disturb the you disturb the cup gas on your torch. But that doesn't mean you can't increase it to start with to speed up and then wait a few minutes and then turn it way down to speed up the whole process. But if you're sucking air somewhere, you it's not going <laughs> to 
you know. It won't matter either way, yeah. Right. I, some of the fixtures I use, I use 5 to 10 CFH. Mm-hmm. But, again, it depends on if I could even clamp it tied up against where it needs to go, um, you know, what configuration it is. I think, I mean, just guessing, I'm thinking 15 CFH is probably the highest I've ran on, like, back purging with a little fixture out in the atmosphere, you know, outside, outside of a chamber. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I've ran 60 CFH in a chamber. Um, in fact... You know, again, you're gonna you're gonna get people like, well, it's way way too far, way too much, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you don't know how my fixture's set up. That's one thing, um, inside my chamber, and that makes a big difference. Um, but I've actually used my dual two stage regulator well, that reads in psi, and we'll you know we'll have that at a, at a certain psi. We won't say just so we won't make people write a, write the show and be like, that's way too much. But that was the only way to get to our target parts per million for what we're, the application we were doing. Whereas, you know, you let it sit and fill at 510 CFH for, you know, however long, a couple hours, and it seemed like you never got to where you needed to be. And I would guess I'm a more impatient person when it comes to that kind of thing. But there are guys out there that say that, yeah, that's that's the correct way to do it and don't go too far. Um, so far as the chamber uh, goes anyway. But, you know, I've seen bad things, like you were saying, Jody, when you get too much gas flow on the outside and you light up and it's just turbulent city. Yeah. It, it makes it a mess. You know, and we're talking about all kinds of different things here. We're talking about purge chambers, purge flexible chambers and, and purging inside of containers. So it's kind of different a little bit. Mm-hmm. Some, some of the same principles apply, but you know, if I'm, I'm remembering back to some cases where I was like maybe welding a 20 foot stick of 24 inch stainless steel welding a 90 on the end and having you know everything taped off well you've got to worry about how much how much of that joint can you tape off versus how much do you have to have open while you're welding it and peeling the tape loose as you go and things like so i might have 50 cfh or more on something like that for a while and then at the very end of it when i'm about ready to seal it up i might have as little as 15 cfh right. you know it just you kind of got to it's a, you know you got to be paying attention. You got to be thinking to what's going on here. Like, uh, how many openings do I have, and how's that? How are things going? And you know, it's not always a exact science, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Do you brought a good point? I'm not saying weld at 50, 60 CFH. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm yeah. saying get to your purge level. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, I just bring that up to say there's all kind of scenarios. That's all. Yeah, that's why I wanted to bring that up because that's a very common thing and that's a common problem that you have when you're purging is you the pressure on the inside of whatever tube or part you're doing it'll find its way out and usually that's through your molten puddle so that's why if you're trying it and you're getting like a and it's spitting back at you and it's going crazy and you're wondering well what the heck i'm purging it it should be beautiful it's because there's too much pressure on the inside and it's wanting to Mm -hmm. come out and also, like Jody was saying, you know, you start out filling it all up and, you know, you might be welding up big gaps and all that. But as you're filling up those gaps, if you end up with a little tiny thing at the end, you got to turn your, your pressures way down because it's just kind of like putting your thumb over the end of the hose. You know, that's going to be screaming out of there, out of that little mm-hmm. tiny hole versus all the other leaking out all over the place. So as yeah. you get closer to the end of sealing everything up you want to be kind of turning your purge down just a little bit every ever so often and you know there's plenty of argon in there it's purged out so as long as you don't shut it off it'll stay pretty good on the inside but as long as there's good flow going in and coming out of vent somewhere you should be good yeah did you see in the last video that we're talking about or we're referencing here where i made that little x slot Mm-hmm. And the aluminum tape, mm-hmm. that's something that I did for that reason because I got bit, you know, from it just blowing out on me from having everything sealed off tight, you know. And, and, and you know, you're going out and making, a, making what you think is a perfect root pass, and then you seal it up, and then, <clears throat> you know, oh, crap. And now you got to get the ziz wheel out, regroove, repurge, and everything. And I, and I learned that by making that little X slot, if I was using either duct tape or aluminum tape, when I finally made that seal off, it would just open up as needed and vent off. I wouldn't have that problem. So that was a kind of a little epiphany for me <laughs> doing that. I liked in that video how you had said you poke like four holes or something. So as you're rotating the part around, you always have mm-hmm. a vent hole that's high. Because remember, 
not to sound dumb or anything or dumb things down too much, but argon is a heavy gas. It'll always be on the bottom side. So you want the atmosphere that might be left in there, you want that to rise to the top and go out your vent. So that's the best way to get a good purge is to have your vent at the top all the time. Well spoken, well said. And, you know, you're not always able to manipulate your part, but in that case I was, and I probably actually should have poked my holes dead up next to the, you know, wall. But the concept, that's what I was thinking about when I was talking about that was definitely always have your vent holes at the topmost area because that's that's the best, most efficient way to displace oxygen out of there. And another thing, too, is, you know, if you have kind of a, like, say it's a, a manifold or something like that that's going up and down and around and turning and has little pockets and stuff, well, while it's purging, move it around mm-hmm. because atmosphere will get trapped in little corners and it won't purge out. So you just kind of shake it, move it around, flip it around once or twice. That's all it needs, and mm-hmm. that'll help a lot. If you're having a problem and it's you're and it's not purging out the way you want it to, just try flopping it on its side and you know make sure that that vent is at the top and just kind of shake it just a little bit, and it might free up a little air bubble or something that's caught in there. Yeah. I mean, we had this titanium part that we welded in a chamber and it was, it looked like a wagon wheel and there were all kinds of little instrumentation lines that ran through it and all kinds of little nooks and crannies. And uh, fortunately it was like on a bearing axle and you could kind of spin it in the chamber, but you needed to spin it like slowly spin it to give it time. Even though this was in a chamber still, there were pockets that were, low and high and you have to you got to give it time for that argon to displace everything and push it out the top vent hole even in an argon chamber you have to do that because uh the part just had nooks and crannies and pockets and stuff in it and so just slowly spinning it would allow the argon to reach all those places and displace all the oxygen out of there yeah and again it, it sounds like we're being really nitpicky and taking things to the extreme but like what is it to take 30 seconds and turn the part a couple times and just make sure that mm-hmm. everything's good? Nothing. Yeah, I know. That particular part that I just referenced is probably a couple hundred grand for each part, you know? And uh, so, yeah, 20, 30 minutes, 20, 30 hours <laughs> would have been worth it. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Uh, you don't want to shortcut certain things. Absolutely agree. Well, do we want to wrap this one up? I know it's a. Uh... A pretty deep rabbit hole we can easily go down and i think we touched on quite a few things and maybe confused a whole bunch of people but maybe made them a little bit more interested in figuring out how to purge some parts that they may not have done before i think if we could put a pin in it here you know i think probably a lot of people wonder about maybe solar flux or those flux coated tig rods that they advertise you can weld a tig root without shielding gas but I'll just button that up and saying that that is no fun. Yeah. <laughs> I bought some of that stuff to try it, and it, that solar flux stuff. It's, oh, it, I it's had, nasty. I had, I worked a paper mill outage years ago, and that's what we were doing. Instead of purging the stainless steel pipe joints, was we were using solar flux on the root pass, and it, it just like it's kind of fun to weld stainless steel root pass, you know, open butt root pass. It's not fun to weld it with solar flux. And even the, even the second pass is not fun because it takes about that far to kind of get where it kind of welds a little bit fun. So it was just a struggle. It was just like welding in mud, you know I mean? Just like you don't feel like you're a craftsman at all. You feel like I'm just slugging this stuff together and maybe it'll be okay in the end. You don't feel like you're producing a good product. It does work as far as prevent sugaring, but it, it's like it's, no, it's, a, it's just a mess. And so that's all I'm going to say about that. So if anybody wonders about the flux-coated rods or solar flux, I would just advise you to avoid it and use purge gas instead. Yeah, same here. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, for not to, like, talk about it anymore, but for the, the cost of it, the annoyance of it, and the mess of it, what is it to just tape it off and purge it with argon? Exactly. I swear, if I was even having to pay for the argon myself, I would pay for the argon myself, as opposed to weld a joint with solar flux, like and what we were doing there on that paper mill. I just don't think it saved him anything. I think at the end of the day, 
I don't. I just don't think it saved him anything, because it just doesn't. Purging is not as big a deal as it seems. So you know, to to take the time and swab solar flux on your rod and swab it, mix it up with alcohol, swab it all over the joint, do all that, and then struggle through the first two passes to get it to look decent, as opposed to just taping everything off and hooking up some argon. I didn't see any savings there. You know, on time morale sure was down. <laughs> amongst the welders, you know, it's like, God, yeah. this sucks. Yeah. Nobody felt like they were doing the right thing. You know, it was just horrible. I hated it. Hated every minute of it. But then the argument could be made that if you're out there in the middle of nowhere and don't have the access to purging, keep some solar flux on the truck. Yeah. If, it, if it's a last it, resort, Hey, you, you do what you got to do, but if you can avoid it, I would avoid yeah. it. <laughs> Argon works really good. Mm-hmm. It does. Well, that's a good place to put a pin in it. Yep. I just wanted to put that extra, throw that extra little uh, zinger in there, in case anybody was wondering about those flux-coated TIG rods or solar flux. You know, don't recommend it. Yeah. Okay. Like Roy said, to, to button this thing up, to summarize it, if you think it needs to be purged, purge it. If it, if the material costs a lot, purge it. When in doubt, purge it. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're in agreement. Well, we would like to once again thank those that are supporting the podcast. The The support for the podcast on Patreon is definitely growing, and we definitely appreciate that. This month, we'd like to once again thank Steve Funk, Eric Rupel, Thor Goodmanson, No San Juan, Shane Gunnan, Jacob Elder, Dave Horvath, Scott Silva, and House of Chop. If you would like to support the podcast, head on over to patreon.com forward slash Welding Tips and Tricks Podcast. And if you'd like to reach us here at the podcast with any purge welding questions, you can reach us at Welding Tips and Tricks Podcast at gmail.com. Or if you'd like to leave us a voicemail, our phone number is 915 308 7024. I'm Roy Crumbrand. I'm Jody Collier. And I'm Jonathan Lewis. That's a wrap. And that's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have we don't have designated that's a wrap people, so we just chime in. <laughs> oh yeah. Anytime. <laughs>